Uh, hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome everyone, those who are in the audience and those who are on Zoom to the presentations of the computational projects of the four fellows of 2223. Uh, we have uh, people from across the university, uh, biomedical engineering, civil engineering, and actually two marine sciences, one graduate and one undergraduate. So uh, again, for those of you who don't know the program, the idea is to foster interdisciplinary uh, research across the university, uh, allow students and researchers to overcome computational hurdles, whether they are in algorithms or data science, and to empower them to do deeper research with larger data set. A lot of our project this year kind of revolve around machine learning and data science. And so I'm looking forward to hear from our four presenters. Our first presenter is Jeffrey Servil, who's from Biomedical Engineering. And he's been working with Ravi Padapali to, um, to port his code to Triton. Please go ahead. Thank you. Hi, so my name is Jeffrey Serville, and my project is orientation selective deep brain stimulation of midbrain circuits in the Yucatan micropig for improving gait after incomplete spinal cord injury. First off, I'm going to start with the basics of the mesencephalic locomotor region, or the MLR. And um, previous research has defined this brain region uh, through electrophysiological experiments. Um, and it's known that uh, stimulating here produces walking. This same circuit is evolutionarily conserved across different species. And um, stimulation of the MLR has been used as a uh, current therapy for freezing of gait in Parkinson's disease patients. We aim, however, to utilize this concept for improving walking after incomplete spinal cord injury. The anatomical correlates of the MLR are controversial. However, they do, um, the MLR consists of the uniform and pedicula ponte nuclei. You can see here uh, with the blue circle outlining the two. We, um, although it's controversial, we can explain the mixed results through human um, MLR DBS interventions. As we utilize, however, the pig, which is a translational large animal model, um, by first implanting the pigs with uh, human sized deep brain stimulation electrodes and um, implanting intramuscular EMG so that we can monitor the MLR DBS efficacy during manual treadmill experiments. An example of a uh, facilitation of ongoing locomotion can be seen at the bottom right, in which we see uh, pattern stepping and then a increase in stepping frequency. This can be more um, apparently seen here, uh, by the frequency, the stepping frequency increase as we increase the amplitude of stimulation. Also, other um, parameters that are of use are the mean EMG amplitude and the burst area underneath the curve. The main computational workflow for this project, um, I guess the zoom screen is blocking some of this diagram here, but there's basically uh, three imaging acquisition sessions. Uh, the first one, the diffusion weighted MRI is acquired about two weeks before any implantation and um, is the bulk of this image processing uh, stage and tractography generation. The other modes of MRI um, data and um, imaging data in general, or you can't see here, but the post-operative CT, which allows us to um, reconstruct the exact position of the electrode and orientation in the brain relative to 
uh, structural areas in the brain that are determined from the structural MRI that's acquired before implantation. This structural MRI also helps us to target the brain um, region, the MLR, so that we can um, determine its target coordinates during surgery. The main um, project objectives as it relates to um, IDIS uh, program is the, to overcome computational bottlenecks that are commonly encountered in uh, the pre-processing of DWI images. Now these stages can uh, take up to 16 hours um, as I have experienced before on my average computational resource computer. However, uh, because of IDIS ability to um, help me uh, and help me upload a uh, MRTRIX environment or uh, on the Pegasus cluster, we've streamlined this down to basically a 16th of the time or one hour, essentially. And so this is highlighted here, and this is, was the major bottleneck in our pipeline and is now, like I said, easily um, integrated into a common base work. Here's a general um, whole brain uh, tractography in yellow, you can see. However, we um, specifically see the tractography generation algorithm using just the MLR in order to um, pinpoint the specific fibers that are either originating, uh, projecting to or from, and projected to or from the MLR, or the cuneiform and particular pontine nuclei. This is just one of many examples of, um, on the left, we have a uh, in vivo experiment um, stimulation parameters that we see here produce a strong onset of locomotion. Now on the right panel, letters C, D, E, F, and G um, show different orientations of this um, same stimulus amplitude in the model that is generated for this pig specifically, and which fibers are activated um, that are projecting either to the periaqueductal gray or the uh, medullary reticular formation down the spinal cord, which can be seen in blue. See if this will play. This is the same stimulus uh, parameters, it's just in 3D. So it's hard to um, visualize basically the results of a 3D model on a 2D space. And so uh, this is uh, just a quick clip uh, of this specific uh, stimulation of 200 microamps in, in uh, one of our pig subjects. And uh, if it wasn't clear before, because I might have skipped this step, there's so the orange fibers are the ones that are determined to be on or activated by an activating function that has been previously published uh, to be you know, a quick way to approximate neural activation based on the second spatial derivative of the electric potential distribution produced from these contacts. The orange fibers are the ones that are starting from the cuneiform or pendicular pontine nuclei and traversing either to or from the periaqueductal gray region. The blue and white fibers, blue meaning that they're on, are fibers either originating, projecting to or from the cuneiform and then to the medullary reticular formation down the spinal cord. You can see the light blue as we turn. And I'd like to thank everybody on my team, including Dr. Ravi, Ravi uh, Vatapali and IDIS in general. And I appreciate your time. Uh, we will hold the questions till the end, where so we can pass the microphone around. So stick around. Our second presenter is. Kelly Soluri, who is a Master of Science student at the Rosenstiel School. 
She's been working on quantifying bycatch in the Gulf of Mexico. Let me quickly go to my presentation. All right, everybody, thank you so much for coming out uh, to uh, see my final presentation on uh, forecasting bycatch hotspots using multivariate random forest machine learning. I'm really excited to talk to you guys today. So as I spoke in my last presentation on my proposal, bycatch is just a fisheries term for untargeted uh, individuals that are caught by commercial fisheries. And we want to study bycatch because it has a lot of negative impacts uh, from impairing species conservation efforts through catching protected species, disrupting ecosystem food webs by uh, getting keystone species or top predator species, and is economically wasteful because every fish that a fisher can get that can't be profited off of is something that they can't get their money or their, their, their effort is wasted. So we want to mitigate that as much as possible. So how have we historically predicted bycatch? In the 90s, we used uh, generalized, generalized linear models and ratio-based estimators, as well as some of these methods are still used today. It's not a very good fit for uh, modeling bycatch because it's a complex interaction between fisheries, the environment, as well as other uh, other variables and a, a linear model wouldn't really fit that very well. And so in the 2000s, we started using uh, like uh, more different uh, models such as mixed effects models and Bayesian models to better model like uh, previous information informing current information. But these kinds of models were best used for single species in fisheries. And that doesn't really work for bycatch because in many cases, bycatch is the catch of non-targeted species when you are trying to get targeted species. So almost by definition, a lot of our cases are multi-species. And so we want to use a model that can model different variables from different uh, like spatial and geostatistical degrees, as well as uh, different species as well. So with machine learning algorithms, we're in the informational revolution where we're using machine learning for everything because it's a very powerful tool and it's not like bycatch is no exception. So we're using, we're thinking that uh, random forest would be a good model because a uh, good algorithm because random forest has that uh, predictive power to be able to, uh, is very flexible in using different data types, as well as uh, this previous uh, experimental product to your left is a boosted regression tree, which is another type of tree that they've done in California. And we want to test other types of similar uh, algorithms to them because they did a pretty good job on that. But we're not doing our study in California. We're doing it in the Gulf of Mexico region. And so we're using our data set from the NOAA Gulf of Mexico Observer Bottom Long Line Reef Fish Fishery, which spans from 2006 to 2021, where more than 600,000 observations of total bycatch were observed. This fishery is really great because it fishes more or less along the continental shelf. Uh, and that's a really good place for different species to interact, uh, coastal species interacting with pelagic species, uh, like more open ocean species. And so that this area is pretty good for us to do our study on. So our aim for this is what is the predicted catch per unit effort or the CPUE of multi-species by catch. And so with some data pre-processing details, so we used our NOAA observer program data set for fisheries variables, and we're using also the Gulf of Mexico data atlas for our environmental data. And uh, in the case of missing data with latitude, longitude, year, or month missing, we decided to remove that row because it wouldn't be good for any statistical analyses. Uh, and then for environmental missing data with uh, like things like dissolved oxygen or uh, like sea surface temperature, we used uh, the MICE multivariate imputation by chained equations package in our studio. And so we selected different types of features. Um, we tried to uh, choose environmental variables with productivity measures, such as dissolved oxygen, such as uh, 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 like a nitrogen or phosphate, different nutrients, and environmental variables correlated with habitat, like benthic competition, uh, co composition and depth, as well as different bycatch species caught together uh, and fisheries variables, such as the depth that they were fishing at and the hours fished. Uh, for our species selection, we had a selection of over 260, and so we cut that down to around 30, uh, putting in all our protected species and our top uh, most frequently caught species. And that ended up with a data set of around 11,000 sets. 
So we're using uh, three tests so to test if the random forest was really good compared to other different types of algorithms. So we're using a red snapper, which is supposed to be our uh, like our case study for species that are targeted, even though the individuals caught did not fit into the size or the 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 type of red snapper that they would want. Uh, so this is still bycatch, but targeted species that are still bycatch uh, and abundantly caught in our data set. And then night shark is our representative for species that are abundantly caught as bycatch, but are protected species, so they're untargeted. And then our last one is loggerhead sea turtle, which is a, re a really rare bycatch species and is extremely protected. And so we split all of these uh, around two uh, three fourths, so uh, training and one fourth testing. And we compare that to different suites of algorithms um, in MATLAB uh, regression learner, uh, including support vector machine, booster regression tree, and neural networks. So uh, with Red Snapper, the training data seems to reflect pretty well the testing data. And you can see that uh, for this one, you can at zero, the random forest continuously predicts at higher than the abundance is for the true response. And at higher abundances at around 70 or 80, the random forest consistently predicts under that. But we have a more sweet spot around in the middle where it does more or less follow the perfect prediction line. As for the residuals, we have this, uh, in a perfect residuals plot, we want to see the residuals aggregated around the zero, meaning that the uh, errors are random and the, uh, the errors are minimized. But here we see that it is linear. And this is possibly because there are some variables that we weren't considering that uh, are modeling this nonlinear effect and that are having a really predictive, predictive power. And so there might be something that we're not really considering there yet. As for diagnostics, we're using three types of informational diagnostics. RMSE and MSE, root mean square error and mean square error, are diagnostics of error, so we want them to be smaller than the other algorithms. And R squared is a measure of goodness of fit, where we want that to be closest to one or higher than the other algorithms. So for Red Snapper, the random forest uh, was our best uh, algorithm, seeing that is R squared was higher than the other ones, but it's pretty comparable to uh, boosted regression tree, which is another type of tree machine learning. Um, support vector machine and neural network were not very good fits, a neural network having a negative R squared. And so from that random forest, we've uh, selected the features that were most predictive in this. And so we have uh, our most predictive were more or less environmental variables. So the fishing depth and the depth were the depth of hooks, uh, as well as nitrate, apparent oxygen utilization in uh, the water, the phosphate and the dissolved oxygen were our most predictive variables in this uh, random forest. And then for our species that are most uh, predictive, we have for red snapper, red grouper, golden tilefish, and yellow edge grouper, which are all similar species, similar uh, niches, and similar habitats, as well as they're often caught uh, as uh, tar targeted species, such as red grouper or yellow edge grouper. For night shark, we have uh, our training data and our test data look a little bit different, but you can see that they also somewhat follow the perfect prediction line. We're seeing a lot of the same patterns that we saw in red snapper, where at zero, it predicts at higher than the abundance, and at higher abundances, it predicts, it underestimates it. Uh, but around the middle, we see, again, that perfect prediction line is being followed pretty well. And again, with the residuals, we're seeing that similar uh, pattern where you can compare it to red snapper. I'm sorry, let me stop there for a moment. You can see that that pattern of linear uh, real, uh, residuals going up. It just shows again that at zero, it's being un, uh, over, predict, over predicted, and at higher abundances, it increases linearly the error uh, to under predict the, the actual true response. And so we can see that it's comparable to a red snapper since they're both linear. For our red shark, uh, night shark diagnostics, we see that uh, it has a higher R squared than our uh, than our red snapper, and the for the tree based machine learning uh, algorithms, the Boosted regression tree and the random forest were our best uh, algorithms. And again, support vector machine neural network as well as our other suite of algorithms didn't fare as well. For our night shark feature selection, uh, the dissolved oxygen, salinity, the depth of hooks, nitrate, and apparent ox uh, oxygen utilization, all uh, measures of productivity, except for the depth of hooks, uh, were our most predictive variables. And as for species, we have the yellow edge grouper, the red grouper, 
and the golden tilefish. Oh, sorry, the gray tilefish, pardon. Um, and they're all possible prey species of the night shark, as well as some, two of them are targeted species, uh, really high abundantly targeted species. And I just wanted to also note that one of our predictive species as well is the dusky shark, which is a shark similar to the night shark in habitat and niche. And finally, our rare species, the loggerheads. Um, we see that it has more of a uh, zero to one presence absence uh, because all of the sets only caught one uh, turtle per set. Uh, and so we see again at zero, most of our set is at zero. So there's a bit of an issue with this training and test set because in one, in one trip, we have uh, some outlier events and our data set is much smaller. And so we have this weird effect where it's predicting 0 0.1, 0 0.2 of a turtle when we want to predict a whole turtle. Um, so that's an issue. And again, we see that with the residuals against the true value that if if there were uh, more uh, points in the middle, we'd probably see a linear uh, a linear pattern, but because there's only zero to one, we only see uh, a more binary response. And for loggerhead diagnostics, none of our algorithms were a good fit, though it, it I think it's worth it to say that our tree-based were the best out of the algorithms um, shown, but there wasn't a really good predictive response uh, that we could try because we suspect that the data set is too low to actually see any patterns. And so in conclusion, uh, our random forest can consistently ranks as one of the better predictive models in our suite of different algorithms that we used. Um, the strongest predictors were environmental based, such as depth, nitrate, and dissolved oxygen. And the species associated predictors were similar species in ecological niche and possible predator prey dynamics. All right. And so some limitations in our study is that other confounding factors we haven't considered yet, such as oceanographic data. So currents, eddies, wave heights, these things might be really important for some species. You can see that with species that have a trophic interaction like sharks and, uh, and uh, some reef fish, we can see a better interaction between that. But for a species like a loggerhead sea turtle, which is a generalist species, we not, might not see such uh, involved uh, relationships. And so their relationships might be with more oceanographic data based on where their currents are, where the sargassum is, things like that. So adding that, we hope that the prediction might be, get, might be getting a little bit better. And that rare species are also shown to be more difficult to predict just because that the sheer number is much smaller and our zeros in those data sets are much higher. So we're thinking we want to be creative of how to try to overcome that. And I'm open to uh, talking with anyone or answering any questions on how we could maybe make it this prediction a little bit better. But the possibility of maybe some grouping some species together. So instead of predicting loggerhead sea turtles, we predict protective species. And so in that way, no fishery wants to catch a like a protected species. So if we just bunch it together, it might make a more substantial data set. But that's just one idea. I'm open to learning more. So for our next steps, we're adding oceanographic variables and reviewing our current variables that weren't really adding to the model and taking those out perhaps. Uh, and then brainstorming of how to deal with our data limited species. And finally, getting our uh, better predictive model and creating a geospatial map by latitude and longitude, similar to the uh, ecocast model of the California coast that we saw before, so we can compare it. And so that fishers can make a decision on where to choose fish fishing spots better uh, and mitigate bycatch. So I'd like to acknowledge my committee, Dr. Beth Babcock, Dr. David DA, and Dr. Paul Richards, as well as the Babcock and DA Fisheries, Fisheries Labs, as well as my mentors, uh, IDISC in the Computer Science Department, uh, Dr. Gang, Dr. Vanessa, and Dr. Mitsu, and of course, CMIS and IDISC for funding me. Oh, thank you so much. So questions at the end, but this is my side. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Shara Sukhu. Shara is an undergraduate in the uh, marine science program, double majoring in marine science and um, biology, right?
Right. So I'm Shara, and I'm presenting on the co-occurrence patterns that I found in the microbiomes of six species of coral. So, oh, I need to change here. Coral reefs are biological hotspots. What that means is that even though they account for less than half a percent of the ocean sea floor, they contribute to as much as 25% or course of all marine biodiversity. However, it is expected that by the end of 2050, 90% of coral cover will be lost. But not all hope is lost because corals are extremely resilient organisms. So this image on the right here was taken off a reef a couple of years after a severe thermal bleaching event. And as you can see, it looks really healthy now. In addition, humans have been helping to restore these uh, devastated reefs by outplanting corals. But the challenge with that is that we want to outplant resilient corals. Otherwise, they're just going to fall victim to the same factors that cause these corals to die in the first place. Um, so the first step in doing that is that we need to understand more about the coral organism. They are very complex, so it's very challenging to understand what's going on there. And um, one of the problems with it is that the coral is not just a singular organism. They're kind of like us in the sense that they have these symbionts, including these bacteria. And this coral-associated bacterial community has recently gained a lot of interest from the scientific community for the ability to confer resiliency to bleaching, to disease, and nutrient loading. Uh, there's also received for some negative interest as well, because there are species of bacteria that cause disease in corals, they're pathogenic. However, a lot of this research look at the coral microbiome from a compositional point of view. So they say, how did the composition of the microbiome change in response to environmental factors or disease, but they don't look at the interactions between the bacteria in this community. So this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to look at the interactions by investigating the co-occurrence patterns in the coral microbiome. And what I specifically wanted to see was what are these key bacterial species and groups and what functions they might have. And um, my data set was really interesting because they sampled across different species of coral. So I wanted to see if these key bacterial species, would they be the same? Would they be different as we looked at different coral species? And what was also interesting about my data set was that we sampled in 2021 as well as 2022. And between those years, there was a change in the water that the corals were being kept in. So in 2021, the water was um, a fresh water mixed with salts, like synthetic salts. But in 2022, the water was ocean water being pumped into the tanks. So I wanted to see if the, um, these key bacterial species would change in response to that change in water source. So this is what my data set looked like. Uh, so in 2021, they sampled six species of coral, and then for each species, 30 samples were taken. But in 2022, they only sampled four species of coral. Those are the ones shown in the black box. And then for each species, they took 10 samples. Now, the coral microbiome, the bacteria in corals, they are extremely hard to culture. They don't take well in petri dishes. So my study took a genetic approach where we quantified and identified the bacteria in these samples. Um, using uh, um, sequencing methods. So what I ended up with, I had these sequences of DNA that um, they, they are reflective of a particular bacterial species. And then for each sample, I have the number of times that that sequence, so that bacterial species was seen in the sample. So this is a compositional view of the 2021 data set. It's very crowded, but I just wanna show that for every species, so every box, the dominant taxa is different and the compositions of it is, is different as well. So in my networks, what I expected to see that the, the networks would be species specific as well. And this is the compositional comparison from 2021 to 2022. And again, I just wanna show that um, these dominant taxa changed completely from 2021 to 2022. So if we just look at that last box, the O5, it went from being mostly blue to mostly yellow. And I also expected to see that in my networks as well. So just some details on what I did to clean up my samples. I removed the mitochondrial and chloroplast taxa because although those are bacteria, we're not really interested in those. We know what they do. And um, because there were different amounts of data sets in 2021 and 2022, I tried to subset the, tans the taxa with more than 10 reads and at least three samples per species. And then because each sample gets different amounts of sequences, like different total abundances, to be able to compare sample to sample to standardize that, I use centered log ratio. 
to find my relationships between my bacterial species. I use experiment correlation, and I only accepted a correlation as being valid if it had an absolute value greater than 0 0.8 and a significance of p-value less than 0 0.05. Now, what was really interesting about my current occurrences was that in 2021, we found no significant negative correlations. And at first we thought this was an error and we went back and did it all over again. But it, it showed up again, even using different packages. And what we concluded was that there was no competition in this data set. Now, this is very interesting. And I think it would be worth looking at the samples of the water source during that year to see if that pattern was also present in the water sample. Something that was also uh, interesting and a limitation of the study was that even though that the number of taxa were more or less the same from 2021 to 2022, except for MCAV, which is an exception that I can explain if anybody's interested at the end, um, the number of nodes was much higher in 2022. And we think that um, that is a result of the 2021 data set being more diverse because there were more samples. So it's not exactly fair to compare across years for different number of samples. But these are my network plots from 2021. Um, just to explain what is going on here. So every dot or node is a bacterial species and every line in between them it represents a relationship between those two taxa. So the nodes are colored by bacterial families. And as you can see, the colors are pretty random. They're all over the place. So there's no clustering by family. In addition, uh, I size the nodes according to the abundance of the, of the bacterial species. And you can see they're all pretty small. I had to bring some up to like a threshold value as well. And that kind of reflects that the, these bacterial species that are interacting with each other and kind of uh, structuring microbiome in a sense, they're present in really low abundances. These are the network plots for 2022. And unlike the 2021 data set, you could see that they're clustered by family. There's a lot of red happening in OFA, and there's like these little yellow clusters. And compared to the 2021 data set, we see more tightly knit clusters and there's strong separation between them. So to look at the groups that I thought would be important, I uh, clustered using greedy modularity maximization. And this finds a community partition with the largest modularity. And having found those groups, I wanted to find out, are they functionally significant? So in 2021, I found that the members of these groups belong to different families, but that's not to say that they can't have different function, they, they can't have similar functions, because we found that even though bacterial species belong to different families, they sometimes play a role in the same or similar processes. In 2022, as I explained before, the members belong to the same families, and why that might mean that they have a dissimilar function, it could also mean that they just like to hang out together because they have the same taxonomic lineage. So this is a sample of my clustering data. So this is the ASA clusters from 2021. There were only three. And what was really, really interesting about this was that um, in the first cluster, there are species from different families that all play a role in sulfur cycling. And this kind of gives the idea that maybe these clusters do have some kind of functional significance. Now, as I mentioned before, the problem that we have with the a coral microbiome is that we can't culture these bacteria. So if we can't culture them, it's very hard to figure out what their functions are. So maybe by figuring out what uh, clusters they're in, and now that we know that you know these clusters are functional, we could classify them into we could classify their functions using this method. So that's that's really cool and really new. I haven't seen any uh, literature about this before. Um, this last cluster was also really interesting. There were only a few bacteria here that we, are, we know to be pathogenic. Uh, however, now that we know that these are the other bacteria that interact with them, we could, we could also look at how they react to environmental cues because if they're the ones interacting with them, then how they change in response to the environment will affect them um, and possibly upregulate or downregulate their abundance and therefore their virulence in the coral. So to find my, uh, my key species, I use page rank analysis. This is a version of eigenvector 
and it counts the number and quality of links for each node. So if I have an initial node and it's highly connected to other nodes, which they themselves are connected to many other nodes, then that means that my initial node is, um, is very well, it has a higher page rank and is more important in the network and probably plays a major role in structuring the network. So I found the 20 highest scoring nodes and I compared them across species and across years. And across species, I found that there was no significant overlap. So I showed some of the, the, over, the only overlaps that I found here. And you can see it's only one species and it's pairwise relations. And what this may suggest is that um, the species that structure the microbiome uh, are specific for the different coral species. Um, when I looked at it across years from 2021 to 2020, 22, for each coral, there was no overlap. So that reflects that from 2021 to 2022, because there was that change in water source, the corals overhauled their microbiomes completely in the sense that they changed the uh, bacterial species that were structuring the microbiome. And this is reflected in the compositional data where we saw that dramatic shift from indominant taxa. And this is why, is because they changed the bacteria that are structuring the microbiomes. Uh, the last thing that I did was I compared the page rank analysis with another technique that is more compositional in data in nature to identify the key species. So this is um, is a prevalent taxa method, and it finds the bacterial taxa present in 58% of the samples for that species. Now the advantage of using that compositional method is that is very easy to do is literally a single line of code when you use the package and it runs very quickly. Compared to if you want to do page rank, you need to run the core occurrences, which takes a very long amount of time. And then you need to build your networks and then you need to get the nodes and do your page rank analysis on it. However, when you work with that network, you get more sensitivity in picking up those key bacterial species. And as I found, there was no overlap between the prevalence and the page rank. So we can't use the prevalence, even though it's easier, as a proxy for finding these um, uh, bacterial species that structure the microbiome. So my key takeaways was that my networks were uh, both specific to the coral species as well as the environment. And we saw that from 2021 to 2022. And as I just mentioned, the prevalent taxa can't be used as a proxy to find the bacteria involved in structuring the microbiome. Going back to my research question, what are the key bacterial species and groups and what might their functions be? We saw that the clusters seem to have a common function and they're involved in the same or similar processes. Um, uh, also, we found that the most important nodes, they varied across species and they change in response to the change in water source. So for future studies, I would like to make the data sets more comparable. So if I had to do this over, I would probably subset the 2021 data to get 10 samples and then compare it. So you see here the 2021 uh, graph for ASA compared to 2022, and one is, they look very different. And I think if we subset it, then they might look a bit more similar. Um, in addition, I would like to look further into these functionally significant groups. The problem with the data set is that they're not annotated down to the species level. So I would like to get those sequences, well, I have those sequences, blast search them, um, annotate them down to the species level, and then do research on that to find out the functions of these uh, bacteria. And I'd also like to do that for the, um, the top 20 page rank, because although they didn't overlap from uh, coral species to coral species, I think it would be interesting to see if, the, if there's an overlap in the function of those page rank taxa. I also think it'd be really interesting to look at the pathogenic groups, to look at how the interactions in those groups change in response to environmental factors and see if uh, those changes lead to an increase in the virulence of the patch uh, pathogens. And lastly, um, I only use Spearman correlation to find my interactions between species. And I think it would be interesting to look at different uh, techniques to build networks and see if there's if there's like a perfect network, if there's one that these um, algorithms keep coming back to to identify what is the best technique uh, to use when working with coral associated bacteria. Uh, in conclusion, I'd like to thank Moot Marine Lab for allowing me to use their data. It was a huge data set and it was very kind of them to allow me to, to use it. 
And I'd like to thank my mentors, Dr. Grace Klingers at Moat Marine Lab, Dr. Manohar Murti from the College of Engineering, and Dr. Nikki Trailer Knowles from Rasmus. Last but not least, Father um, Evans. Father was a PhD student in civil engineering, and he's been looking at using machine learning to improve uh, concrete structures. Hi, everyone. Uh... Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, present to you my project, which is on um, evaluating concrete samples by segmenting and quantifying their micro cracks. Uh, these concrete samples are obtained from uh, micro CT scanning. So what is the purpose? Basically, we want to assess our concrete samples to see the level of damage in them. A lot of these damages show themselves in the form of cracks, right? So our idea is to segment these micro cracks, which are typically in the range of 10 to 50 micrometers, and they're found with micro CT scanning. And based on that, try to theoretically or uh, with some theoretical uh, formulas, try to evaluate a metric of the damage in the system. So this is what we expect from our model, to give it an image and from that get a mask, segmented mask. And using those masks, we can reconstruct the 3D model and uh, evaluate the sample. For example, here, the blue uh, bubbles are the voids inside the sample and the red areas are the cracks. This is not uh, my project. Work. So uh, to achieve that, we... Uh, group these uh, steps into two phases. On the first phase, we want to uh, gather a data set from different uh, studies and literature and to do an initial training on them. In the second phase, we want to construct our own data set, which is specific to our use case, try to transfer the learning we did in the first phase and fine tune the model and uh, evaluate the performance of our model. So let me start with the first phase, which is the data set collection. Uh, the data, data set that we collected uh, consists of around 12,000 images. We, as you can see, they have different textures and cracks and like different objects in them. Uh, some of them, for example, this one is on asphalt. Some of them are on rocks, so concrete, and so on. So we have a variety of uh, textures. Uh, we divided this into 75% training, 15% eval, and 10% for testing. Uh, so the training, the first phase of training was done on this data set from literature. Uh, there are a lot of ways to do segmentation. The approach I'm taking is to use an encoder decoder segmenting, which is basically you give it an image, uh, the model basically breaks down this image into smaller scale and uh, extract the most fundamental information from that image, then tries to upscale and reconstruct that uh, um, object into your segmented mask. Uh, so basically we have two different architectures interacting in this model here. First is the segmentation architecture, which is basic, basically the interaction of encoder-decoder layers. And then there's the convolutional layers, which are uh, the order and depth of these uh, layers, convolutional layers inside each uh, section. Um, so for these, I've tried three different segmentation architectures. Unit obviously is the most famous one, but I also tried LinkNet and Feature Pyramid. Uh, um, and also for the CNNs, I use around eight to 10 different CNN architectures. So this is what it looks like. Basically, you have a VGG16, for example, as your CNN model uh, with known um, layers, sizes, filters, and so on. And you have the unit general uh, architecture. For example, here it shows like 
uh, which layers were concatenating and so on. And when you put these together, you get this unit with VGG16. And so, as you can see, we have a very wide variety of different architectures to go through. Uh, the parameters that I played with mostly were segmentation architecture and CNN model, which are the most famous ones, but also CNN model depth, weight, initialization, dropout, and other hyper parameters that we tried. Also, the data was augmented a lot to give it even more uh, variety. For example, shifting, flipping, rotating. Uh, we added some Gaussian noise, uh, different uh, image color uh, variations, for example, brightness, sharpness, and so on. Uh, blurring and elastic transformers were uh, especially important because these uh, can um, blur the uh, threshold between crack and the background. So it helps the model distinguish where the boundaries are. So these are the two most important uh, augmentation that we did. Okay, so I'm gonna go through some of, uh, some of our experiments that we did. Uh, first one was the CNN model itself. So what I did was I tried the most famous CNN models, for example, ResNet, Inception. These are usual models that are uh, developed by Google, Microsoft, and so on. So these are known uh, models that have shown their efficiency before. Uh, as you can see, almost all of them show very good uh, performance in terms of IOU and loss. Uh, especially the dotted lines are the eval um, graphs. And as you can see, the evals are higher than training. This is because the amount of augmentation that we did and the noise that we introduced uh, lowered the training uh, performance, but in reality, in evaluation, the performance was higher. Uh, but overall, the difference between the models is low. They are all performing very well. This is some of the most difficult pictures that I've chosen from the test data set. As you can see, for example, VGG19 can differentiate between the crack and the flower, but ResNet cannot. On the other hand, ResNet can identify, identify the entire crack here, but VGG19 is incapable. Uh, the other thing was trying to see how the depth of the CNN models affect it. For that, I used ResNet, which can have a depth from 10 all the way to 152, which is uh, very gigantic. And the difference was not... Um, present at all, and that's expected because 12,000 images in reality for these huge and deep uh, models is not enough. Uh, so even like maybe ResNet 10 that I'm uh, hoping to try next can be enough for this uh, architecture. Uh, as you can see, the difference exists between 152 and 18, the most extreme cases, but all of them overall perform well. Uh, the other one is to see how segmentation architecture affects it. This is also really important. For example, UNET, LinkNet, and FPN over here. Um, as you can see, fundamentally, some of these are very different. Um, so again, the performance was close between them. All of them performed very well. Um, yeah. Exploring the hardest images, you can see the difference. For example, LinkNet, LinkNet was not able to detect anything for this image, whereas FPN was great. On the other hand, LinkNet uh, kind of uh, didn't classify flower as a crack, whereas FPN did. Um, and obviously, UNET performed very well with this one. Um, dropout rate uh, is something that a hyperparameter that they usually uh, play with. But because I introduced a lot of noise and augmentation, uh, dropout didn't really show itself. So even zero versus 0.4 didn't show much difference because the in, amount of noise that I initially introduced into the model. That is the same for initialization. I tried random versus uh, initializ initialization on the ImageNet dataset. Um, the performance was quite the same. 
This is some of the performances of some selected models on the test data set. As you can see, all of them are showing perfect scores, which is good, but is not useful. So what we want is, although we can say like all of them perform better, uh, well, but we want to see which one actually performed incrementally better than the other ones. So that's why we're trying to play with some of these metrics. For example, try weighted uh, F1 or so on to uh, find out which one is actually has the better performance than the other ones. So that's something that we're still working on. Um, but when you use these all of these good performing per, uh, models on something that we scan from our own concrete you see the performance is not good at all uh, either they don't find anything or they found a very uh, unrealistic crack um, or they cannot um, find the entire length of the crack so these are not useful this will give us very wrong uh, values when we try to quantify the crack so that brings us to the second phase, which is try to build a data set that represents our own problem. And that is done through the macro city, as I uh, mentioned. So we uh, basically cast and cure different concrete samples with a lot of different uh, parameters. This stage can take up to a month for some samples. Then we try to induce micro cracks in them through cycles of loading and load, unloading. Uh, then we do scanning and uh, annotation or uh, labeling them. And then we can use this data set. What we want is we want to be able to identify these very, very fine uh, cracks. So as I mentioned, I'm working on the uh, building data set still. Right now, uh, we've uh, made around 17 different samples. As you know, these uh, scans give you a 3D matrix of 8-bit uh, elements. Basically, the depth can be 500 to 700 images. So in theory, each one of these samples can be multiplied by, let's say, 500, which will be a large data set. But because they're very similar to each other, uh, it's better to use like 20 to 30 uh, layers from each sample. But still, I plan to build a 40 sample data set times uh, 20 to 30 would be a good uh, size of the data set. After that, we will do the transfer learning. Um, this is, as you know, a very useful method that also, uh, especially is used in medical cases because in these in some areas, some pathologies are rare and you cannot have like hundreds or thousands of uh, images from them. So what they do is they train the model on a uh, data set that has similar characteristics and then try to change the domain and fine tune the weights uh, for their specific cases. That is what we want to do. Uh, we're almost at this stage to adjusting the domain and after we uh, acquire our own data set, we can freeze some of the layers and do the fine tuning. In terms of which layers to freeze, uh, I've, um, th I've done some uh, exploring, but it, the result will be obvious when I can uh, play with my own data. But basically we want to um, retain low level information freeze those layers, for example, these layers, and only fine tune uh, these high information uh, layers, uh, for example, in unit. After that, we can get the, our final performance, which is uh, get the performance of uh, the final uh, the, uh, model. We can quantify the cracks. We can, um, and we can evaluate the extent of uh, damage in the crack based on uh, sorry, extent of damage in the sample based on the cracks. The other idea that we had is after we quantify these ideas, we can use these masks to uh, uh, convert the images back into a 2D uh, model. So as, you, as I said, 
uh, we have 500 to 700 images from each matrix, right? We can run all these images through the model to get masks for each one of them, and then take these masks and reconstruct the 3D model. That would be something useful to do, uh, especially like I've run into cases where I wanted a 3D image of my crack. Um, this can have uh, very useful uh, applications. I want to thank my academic advisor, Dr. Garaman Nejad, and Dr. Chapman, my iDesk uh, mentor. Thank you. Great. Thank you all. I would also like to congratulate you on all the hard work that is put into preparing the data set, acquiring the knowledge, talking to your advisor, setting up the meeting. It's uh, it's time consuming and not uh, an easy thing to handle when you have other things going on. Uh, I would like to open the floor for questions and answers. So uh, we need the microphone for. I think it's on, right? Yeah, it's on. Um, yes, it's on. Okay. Uh, Jeffrey, so what are you going to do next uh, now that your turnaround time is 16 times faster? <laughs> oh, the next step is definitely. So preparing the pieces between. Okay. So uh, the question was, what am I going to do next? And the next steps are group analysis, um, looking at differences between, or differences and similarities between subjects, um, which each have their own subject-specific model by now. And basically the parameters, which fibers are being activated more often than others when we see the same uh, product uh, production of locomotion, say at a certain speed too, and then um, we can determine a, a, a better relationship on a, a group group level, essentially. And like I said, well, this data set is, is massive. I mean, you have three different, at least three different uh, images that can be upwards of, so a diffusion weighted image can have, it's really four dimensional. It's not just three dimensional. You have also the um, gradient um, diffusion, diffusivity uh, terms that add a whole nother, like 186 times, uh, however long your, your image was. So, yeah, just going back and forth. Yes. Hi, I have a question for Shara. Um, I was wondering if the yellow dominant apple microbiomes. Oops. So, hi, Shara. Uh, I was wondering whether the yellow dominant apple microbiome, if you knew the functionality of that group and why it was so dominant in the water quality samples in 2022, like do the, does the functionality of that microbiome match with the uh, water conditions of the, of 2022? So I didn't look at the, um, the microbiome of the water samples for those years. Um, it would be interesting to look at and see if those, uh, you know, if, if it, there's some similarity between the water and the corals, but as we saw in the compositional maps, all those corals were being housed in the same water, but they still had different dominant taxa and different like microbial compositions. So there's probably not going to be much of a match because the coral is also selecting for which uh, bacteria they want in their microbiome as well. I don't know if that answered your question. Are there questions from the Zoom audience? I'll, I'll keep monitoring. What was the size of your date, uh, data set? I noticed you had a lot of features. I want to know if you have like a large data set as well. And if you have tried uh, 
reducing the dimensionality of your features, like select a subgroup and like see if they have better correlation with your uh, outputs here. Thank you, Sadeg. So, um, yeah, well, first answer is um, my original analysis was, was with trips. And so that was around 300 trips or so. And so because of the issues that I was already hitting, I was I decided to do it by set. So each trip has around uh, has like around 10, but could be more sets, uh, which means that on every trip, you know, they will cast out a certain number of hooks. And so you can catch multiple species in one set. And that total data set was around 11,000 sets in total uh, for around like uh, 50 variables counting the, the species. And uh, as for correlation, yeah, I did look into correlation, but for this next step, I'm gonna be taking out like the, the features that I saw like didn't, weren't really, really predictive as well as cutting out maybe other species that weren't uh, caught correlated. So instead of just choosing them based on um, how protected they are, how frequently they're caught, also choosing them based on how correlated they are to each other. So does that answer your question? I have a question for you. Okay. Uh, how come the random forest type machine learning are uh, performing better than the others, including neural nets? Yes. So that's a great question. Um, frankly, I have a little bit on, of understanding, but I'm also still trying to figure that question out for myself. But I believe that the tree based, uh, like, algorithms were better off because of the well for neural networks we used a medium neural net and I just don't think that the neural net is really good for that data set or maybe you know I, I didn't set it up right like but I, I don't think that that particular algorithm is a good match for the data set something that surprised me was how bad the support vector machines did because I thought it would be a better match but it wasn't but uh the tree-based ones I know that for random forest, it, it goes off based of two features. Instead of a tree-based uh, algorithm, it goes through bagging and bootstrapping. So bagging is this technique in which you have uh, a bunch of weak learners, in this case trees, and they all learn uh, parallel to each other. Uh, and then in bagging, you aggregate each one of those uh, those conclusions into like a most frequentist response and see that's your answer. And then for booster regression tree, it's more like uh, each tree learns from the previous one. And so why they were they were comparable is, you know, probably because they were tree-based, but why tree-based was the best, I don't actually know. So since yeah. you are there, and I will ask the, uh, your other colleagues as well. Is it on? Okay. Um, uh, great. So you said that you had 11,000 sets and, and so mm -hmm. forth. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a little bit unclear. Is the set represent how many, um, you know, individual animals, so to speak, and how many fish? Is this related to perhaps to the different performance of the different algorithms? And re a related question to that is that about your loggerheads. Mm -hmm. So you don't have enough data. Is it because you don't have in, uh, uh, enough individuals or you don't have enough variables of the individuals? Mm -hmm. So how would you evaluate that? I mean, okay, so I, I'm going to start with the first one, which is the set when you have a, a ship that goes out, that's one trip. And so they can go through uh, many, like you have one latitude and longitude where they stop and they fish, right? And then when they fish, when all of the, the hooks go out, uh, that's one set. Uh, and so you can catch multiple uh, like animals in one set. So in one set, you can have maybe like, uh, I'm, I'm guessing, because each one is quite variable, but if I, mostly it could be like, uh, like 16 red grouper or any other like reef fish. And, you know, if you're lucky, you get like a larger ma like macro fauna, like a shark or in a really, really rare species, like sea turtles or like a sawfish shark, stuff that is more rare. You'd see the data set would look for a rare species, zero for most of the, the data set with, you know, one per set. Uh, it could be two per set, but I didn't see any in the in the set that loggerhead two loggerheads were caught per set. What I did see is that multiple loggerheads were caught per trip. So 
For the trips, you had the outliers where five logger loggerheads were caught in one trip. That's very rare. We haven't ever seen that before uh, in, in the, well, we haven't seen that in this set. And this is all, you know, observed data. It, the observer data itself is uh, a representation of what could be happening out in the ocean. It's around, if we're lucky, like 8%, that's like a, on the high end of how much that observer data covers um, the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, so when we're talking about sets, you could have like, I thought it was good because you can have more than one species interacting. And then it also like made my data set larger. Could you repeat your second and third question, please? Oh, uh, it, it was similar, but since you mentioned that, uh, so the another part, since you mentioned about the sets and so forth, I mean, the, well, what I was going to get is that do you have an idea when you say about the sets, how many how many individual animals you have per set of mm -hmm. the different species? Yes. So you can obviously, okay, great. And the other part is that how about the geospatial aspect of the, so basically you have another kind of variable, with, right, which is a geospatial yeah. uh, aspect. Yes. How do you, uh, you know, collect, you know, that type of information into your modeling or you don't currently? I do. Um, I take it from the Gulf of Mexico data atlas, and we match all of the different satellite, different types of satellite data. So things like depth and uh, like a topography, uh, benthic composition. Uh, so we, we had uh, a couple of variables that was like percent of this uh, square of uh, the Gulf of Mexico had this percentage of mud and this percentage of gravel and this percentage of sand. And in actually one of my slides, if you know, I'll I'll paraphrase it, but in one of the the variables for I I'm I think it might be the one of the reef fish uh, in between some of the the species. So on the higher end, uh, percent sand was, if I'm not mistaken, was a uh, like a pretty good predictive variable. And so benthic and like these kinds of environmental variables from the satellite were appended that were appended from the data set with latitude, longitude, year, and month. Um, were actually good for predicting the 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 presence of Great. that bycatch. Great, thank you. I have I have one more question before we go. Uh, sure. to that. Uh, so, um, but by the way, great presentation for all of you guys. That's fantastic. Um, uh, you know, work that you have all done. I have a question for you, and if you want to share some thoughts, since now you have you know, use some of this uh, kind of techniques, the deep learning techniques and so forth. But you also, you have used different type of data sets, data set that you produce and data set that basically as a golden standard that they're out there. Uh, so can you comment that? I mean, why you see, you know, these kind of big differences and how would you, you know, evaluate that? What does it mean? Do you have any hypotheses? Do you have any um, uh, ways to... to you know, to figure out why this is happening, right? So what, what, why if I get, you know, so many thousands, tens of thousands of images that somebody else produced and run the algorithm runs great, when I produce a data set, you know, which is, has a real data, doesn't necessarily reflect what's uh, happening. Do you mean between uh, the literature data set and my own data or between different images in the literature data set? Uh, we're talking more about the data sets that you created, right, which the algorithm don't perform very well. But in the in the kind of open source literature data sets, it appears that you know the algorithms work perfectly. No matter which ones you use, they, they all work perfectly well. But the ones that you created, right, which is real as well, right, so real experimental data, they didn't work that well or at all. So how can you comment on that? I mean, do you yeah, have any sure. thoughts? Of course. Uh, so. That is actually the idea where it initiated this project because uh, real world concrete has a lot of different uh, uh, like objects, like aggregates, different voids and so on that don't, uh, that correlate with uh, cracks. For example, when I was doing the micro CT scanning, uh, you would have cracks and you would have voids, right? But it was very different to distinguish these from your 2D model of your micro city concrete. So uh, I would I expected this uh, difficulty from the beginning because the concrete micro city images are very noisy, have a lot of objects, whereas crack images from the walls or asphalt and so on are very clean. They have like a singular texture and they have a crack running through. It's very easy for the models 
to I distinguish between those two. Uh, the other thing was that uh, all the models performed well, and the images that I showed was uh, were the images that had the most difficulty for the models to go through. So that was like the minimal um, minimal uh, portion that showed the difference. As I mentioned, like performance uh, was not well. Performance was great, but the differences was not obvious. Uh, and that's because I think the weights are not balanced between the background and the crack. So that's something that we are exploring. We are trying to give different weights to be able to actually see the differences between the models. So I have a question for uh, us. Can, can one of you oh, just, uh, just uh anna you want to ask your question you can unmute yourself can you uh, all right I'll, I'll 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 read your question apart from grouping rarer species have you thought of balancing your classes or uh, pre-processing transformation of input data to account for data imbalance uh are you referring to normalizing the data anna Oh, uh, Mo, maybe you can. Oh, oh you can... Uh, I have to unmute Anna. Participants. Yeah, ask, ask to unmute, maybe. More. Uh, awesome. Yeah. So with random forest regression, you don't need to normalize the data, um, but when you have an unbalanced input um, data set, it could lead to the algorithm making some decisions on how to parse the the tree world if you want to call it that way and um, the search space um, and so I was wondering if you did anything to the input data um, or like what those histograms looked like um, in order re-entering the random forest regressor in order to account for that um, imbalance in your categories or um, values. Mm -hmm. So we had like two different types of like uh, imbalanced categories. And that was, uh, I believe it was red grouper was our highest, most frequent uh, bycatch species. And then a whole bunch of other species that were really rare. And so most of the data set was zero. Um, to account for that, I actually like, for the rare species that were not protected, I just didn't, I just took them out of the data set and didn't include them into the 30 species that I, that I looked at. But um, for the red grouper, I didn't do like anything to, to like balance that data set. And so in comparison, like a loggerhead sea turtle wasn't completely different from the other protected species uh, in that data set, but maybe it's the, it's the red grouper that's disbalancing the data set. So I, I would be open to like learning how to balance that out from the red grouper. So if you can contact me, my email, cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I also have a question for Sadesh. Um, a good job on like testing a variety of benchmark tests um, and different encoders and decoders. Um, but I am wondering if you tried any other basic like image um, processing techniques in order to detect the micro cracks or how that compared with other literature rather than using um, the machine learning? Uh, usually in our lab, we use um, uh, thresholding or like okay. also thresholding or like just uh, uh, boundary thresholding to differentiate between different objects in MicroCity. And that works uh, very well. But for example, when you have uh, something like a crack and other voids, these, these all are empty spaces that basically have the same intensity of X-ray. Therefore, you cannot just distinguish them based on their color, uh, grayscale color or so on. I haven't uh, looked at other techniques. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Mask RCNN, I've heard, is another method that they use to uh, segment images. I haven't tried that. The only methods that I've tried were uh, manual uh, thresholding. 
automatic auto thresholding and this is the new project that I'm trying to do yeah awesome yeah um yeah I'm thinking like beyond thresholding there's some other things but yeah that's that's good that at least you have that benchmark so congrats thank you thank you Right, so I have a question for uh, Sadesh. Uh, so can you tell me uh, just a little bit because um, you know we, we we saw how well the machine learning worked on the literature data set uh, regarding the um, macro sized cracks, uh, but um, you know there was such a, a drop in performance when you tried to apply that method to the uh, micro CT. And I'm wondering, can you tell maybe just speak a little bit about you know what is it that makes the micro CT data so much more challenging? Or do you think that it's mostly just a domain shift issue? Or do you think that it really is uh, more challenging? And then uh, secondly, um, kind of a second question, uh, you mentioned about adding noise or um, doing things to, you know, things that you can augment the macroscopic cracks to make them more challenging. <laughs> and I, I, I guess, uh, you know, my thought about that is that it, as as much as it's more challenging than the original data, it's still not challenging enough for the for the model. So I was I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, some of the augmentation you're doing and some of the ways that you're trying to, I guess, make the um, easy data set at least a little bit harder uh, to try to uh, make it a bit more comparable um, to the um, much more challenging uh, micro CT data set. Thank you. Uh, so the large difference between uh the uh, macro scale data set and the macro scale data set is that the cracks are really finer in the macro scale, um, even in the images. Like some of the macro scale images have like fine cracks, but overall uh, the cracks that you see are very wide, right? But with micro CD uh, cracks, they're like very long, very thin, and usually they run through different uh, voids and holes. Uh, that can make it really hard for the model to distinguish whether it's like a void or it's a crack that is running through it. That's, I think, the first uh, problem. The second problem is that the micro CD images are much more noisier. Uh, like the texture in uh, macro scale images is similar. For example, if you have a crack on the wall and you take a picture, like the texture of the wall is repetitive, right? But in micro scale images, uh, you have aggregates, random aggregates, you have random voids, other stuff, uh, unhydrated uh, cement or other cementitious materials that make it more challenging. It's not like a repetitive texture of the image. Um, in terms of performance, I think there are several problems. One is I think the uh, metric that they usually use for segmentation is not uh, good for this kind of I mean, it performs well. It, don't get me wrong, the performance was not wrong. The problem is that it doesn't distinguish between different models. We want to be able to distinguish. Uh, so the first problem is uh, the criteria, the metric is not very well suited. That's why we want to do uh, weighted metrics, for example, that give more value towards crack. Uh, the second thing, um, was that I think some of the models might be too deep for the uh, actual data set. So that might pose some problems. Maybe uh, they're not generalizing as well. I mean, they're generalizing pretty well, but maybe they're too deep and that is causing some of the problems. Um, not sure. Uh, if I had my own data set, I would be able to uh, answer you more um, with more uh, confidence, but until we get our data set uh, built, annotated, and tested on the models, I don't. I can just speculate at this point. All right. Uh, can I ask one more question uh, quickly? Um, and and um, so so that's just uh, more of a comment about the class imbalance uh, because I think this is something that um, you run into uh, with a lot of segmentation problems. Is that when you're looking for, you know, a needle in a haystack, or in this case, a crack in a large image, right? There are a lot of pixels, and most of them are not the target. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, that is just more of a comment that that's something that can make the segmentation problem a little bit more challenging in terms of, um, you know, making sure 
uh, that uh, the loss function they are using is is um, weighted more toward predicting the um, the positive existence of a crack uh, versus just uh, making sure that it predicts that the background is is not a crack. Absolutely. Yeah, because especially in a lot of semantic segmentation, you have like, let's say five classes and the average, one of them is not like 95%, one of them like 2%, right? Mm -hmm. But in this case, the imbalance is very uh, skewed. Extremely skewed. Yeah, and, and, and I think it's something that, you know, a lot of the segmentation papers that you look at um, are kind of brushing that under the rug in terms of, you know, the purported accuracies. I, I can't tell you how many cityscapes papers predict the sky and the uh, the buildings, but then miss the stop signs because they're small. Yeah. Yeah. You tried like changing, um, playing with the contrast enhanced contrast CTs they have, uh, or different multi different imaging modalities. Perhaps I know you're not going to take an MRI of a rock, but uh, just what are your thoughts on it? Uh, so this is perhaps another feature that you can that you use as something to segment to tell you that look at this is part of the crack. Uh, in the augmentation process, I did a lot of uh, processing on the sharpness on the contracts the contrast and so on like saturation and so on but the problem is the micro city images are 8 bit so they're grayscale they're not color yeah so there's not that much room to play with that but um, mm, that we can like uh, look that, into that more as well um, but i did a lot a, quite a extensive augmentation like I yeah, no, it's just I was saying, like, because you can use at least in the biological sense, like T one weighted or and T two weighted can give you better contrast of gray matter versus white matter, mm -hmm. and that's how we kind of you need both images essentially, yeah. both information in order to determine okay, this is a gray matter, not a white matter. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean. The project is not finished, so for sure we have to play with a lot of other parameters. Uh, but the problem is, I like on the literature data set, the performance is good. It's just like the metric that is not working. But on my own data set, that is something that I hopefully will try when I get it ready for training. Yeah. Thank you so much. So we're kind of running a little bit out of time, especially to to hang out for those who are in the audience. I would like to thank everyone. The most rewarding aspect of today's presentation is uh, just the beginning, it seems to me, and they're opening the door for future research and coll collaboration. Thank you very much for all your hard work. Thank you for all the mentors and their hard work into guiding you through this process. Thank you. Thank you.